Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Point CEO Osama Badir. Hey, what happened to the music? Yeah. Okay, that's enough. Don't take up all my time. It's great to be back. Oh, I need the clicker, by the way. Whoever has a clicker, can I get it real quick? Sorry, guys. Thank you. How are you guys all doing? Another great Money 2020. So, um, this year, I want to talk to you guys about commerce in an increasingly connected world. Now, I know it sounds like a bunch of horse shit. And you're right. I've got another horse story for you. You know, about 100 years ago, this was our primary form of transportation. It was the most efficient way to get around. And there were 22 million horses in America. In fact, these horses created a lot of manure. New York City alone produced 3 million pounds a day. It was a huge health issue. It piled up high in almost every street. The Times of London, because London had this problem as well, the Times of London estimated that by 1950, every city street will be covered in nine feet of horseshit. <laughs> Big problem. And it actually, as experts usually do, they had a conference. It was a 10-day conference, the first international <laughs> urban development conference ever in New York. And they shut it down after three days because they didn't know what to do. And then something very interesting happened. The problem went away. Almost overnight. No one expected it. Why? A new generation of consumers adopted a product in large numbers that made the problem irrelevant. I'm talking, of course, about the automobile. And it created one of the biggest booms in history. 250 million of these now roam our, our streets. It didn't just happen on its own, though. There were three necessary conditions that existed in a perfect storm to make this happen. What were they? First, universal access. The automobile had to be, there was a ton, ton of demand, but the automobile had to be both affordable and available. The, 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 the latter problem was solved by a guy named William Klan at the Ford Motor Company. He was on vacation, and he, was see, he, he saw how butchers disassem disassembled an animal on a conveyor belt and decided you could apply that to cars. The assembly line was born, and cars were made in very large numbers. Supply was almost unlimited. But the other side of the problem, affordability, was solved by car dealerships borrowing from the sewing machine companies the idea of installment plans. You can now buy this thing over time. And as a result, a lot more people bought, prices dropped, and over 75% of cars 10 years later were bought on a loan. The second major thing that happened was upgraded infrastructure. You know, the U.S. national infrastructure for transportation was first a set of canals, and then later converted into railroads. Cars needed roads, and they didn't just get created out of thin air. They actually started where the railroads left off. 130,000 miles of railroads were created by the end of the 19th century. And the way we got our national freeway system was they were converted, they were upgraded to our interstate freeway system. 
and f uh, uh, four million miles of road were created. As a result, consumers, now with the ability to transport themselves, changed behavior like never before. And ushered in a new era, an age of convenience, if you will. And that age of convenience allowed consumers to do things that they were never able to do before. Move about more freely, le relocate, and society grew. The third thing that happened was a third-party ecosystem developed around the automobile. Basically, a bunch of businesses popped up out of nowhere in support of the automobile. They provided services that enhanced the value of the automobile, which created more motorists, and as a result, more services. Things like the gas station, the garage, the convenience store, the drive through restaurant, the drive-in movies, car washes, motels, we didn't have to have a reservation up front, even drive through tellers. And things we didn't want, like drive through liquor stores, which as you'd imagine didn't last very long. <laughs> or drive through wedding chapels, which I think are still popular in some places. But a whole ecosystem, a, a number of billion dollar industries and household names were created. I think we're in a similar moment of opportunity. Why? Because we see consumer behavior change. This is a very finicky uh, clicker. We, they, it, we see a, a similar change in consumer behavior. There's a new generation of consumers this time, the so-called millennials. The millennials are not the shoppers of the future anymore. Today, they already control two and a half trillion dollars of buying power. And over the next decade, they'll control eight trillion dollars. They do things very differently. They are always connected. They always have a smart device on hand. Nine out of 10 of them have a smartphone because smartphones is how they do things. They've never had to do this or use one of these. They've never even seen one of these <laughs> or these. The grocery store comes to them and they can look up prices in a heartbeat. They expect as loyal, loyal customers for, for merchants to know who they are and to treat them like loyal customers. They always look up wherever they're going to eat for reviews, and they always check on those features that they want at restaurants. They communicate in a way we've never done before, constantly and visually. So there's a new age. I call it the age of super convenience. That is now the bar for commerce. Now imagine a world where nine out of 10 merchants also had a smart, connected, multi-purpose device. And this device connected to the world's financial payments infrastructure. You know, 50 years ago, some of the top banks in this country collaborated on a standard for credit cards. And the world's financial infrastructure was born, a payment network that spans every corner of the world, that touches tens of millions of sellers, billions of consumers in every currency. It ushered in the age of e-commerce. But it was missing a few things. It didn't operate like the internet just yet. So some of the tech companies tried to replace this infrastructure. And 20 years later, it's still what we got. So maybe there's a lesson from history where we're not supposed to replace the infrastructure, but connect and upgrade this infrastructure from one that does just payments to one that powers commerce. 
There's a great new trend that I'm excited about in the last few years, where big tech companies and big financial institutions are partnering together to figure out a way forward. And NFC payments is a great example of that, as opposed to everyone fighting for their own standard, collaborating on something that benefits all. And so leveraging this payment infrastructure that we have, 20 years in payments tell me you can't replace it. You've got to upgrade it. It becomes our commerce infrastructure. And that's how we get to connected commerce. Why do we do this? Because 20 years later, the one and a half trillion dollars of electronic commerce on web and mobile is still a fraction, a very tiny fraction of global commerce. So we're nowhere near there. There's a lot of work to do. And there's a lot of opportunity in it. And an opportunity of this size requires an ecosystem. It requires an ecosystem where the infrastructure players and the guys who want to improve consumer behavior collaborate together to address a ton of new opportunity. And a bunch of billion dollar industries will be created and other household names. We're just at the beginning of this road. Our job at Point is to enable. And so last year, we announced our smart payment terminal. And we're very flattered that many have joined us, some by integrating, some by copying. But we think it's OK. We like the innovation. Since then, we've had a lot of progress. We've gotten our devices certified. Whoa. Someone didn't like my last comment. We made a lot of progress. The devices are now certified. It's a lot of work to get a two-screen, two-processor device that can be available, open to third-party apps, to be certified. Hey, Paul, knock it off, man. <laughs> we start shipping next month. I'm very excited about that. And we already have commitments for over half a million units. It's enough to launch us. And as a result, this vision that we have. But we also have three new products to announce. I'll try to do them between going dark. <laughs> Just tell me the beat, and I'll, <laughs> I'll go to it. Um, three new products to announce. Why? Because our job of enabling is not just about the device. A smart device is only as smart as the cloud that powers it. So we, we created a very powerful partner management system. This is where partners log on and manage their network of point terminals. And I will demo that to you in a few minutes. We've also created something very interesting. We think merchants want real-time access to the data out of this terminal, all kinds of data. So we created an app that's co-branded with our partners to deliver an engaging experience for that merchant, including, obviously, the latest stats, the ability to download apps to your terminal, and the ability for your acquirer or ISO to communicate with you. And we give it away free with our terminals. And then third, we put a lot of effort over the last year into our partner SDK, you know, in, into our um, developer SDK. Our goal was to make it simply the easiest terminal in history to integrate to. It wasn't about the number of APIs. It wasn't about the long list of things that it could do. We wanted the most common things to be available and very easy to do in hours, where it used to take weeks or months. And so I'm going to demo some of this to you. I'm going to invite Charles Fang, one of our engineers at Point, Hi. to help me with the demo. Great to be here. Nice to meet you, Money 2020. Hey, Charles. So if you can open up Mission Control. Yep. I'm also bringing up a few devices. We've built a few more since last year. So we have to put them on a wall. It's really the only way we can demo the power of Mission Control. 
Imagine this is a fleet of terminals. Obviously, it will be a little bit bigger, but we, this is all we can fit on stage. These things are connected like every other terminal would, would be. Actually, it's Wi-Fi. So I'm going to test the Wi-Fi in this, in this building once again. Um, and through the internet, every single one of the devices is connected to mission control. Our partners have access to everything that's happening on a device. Obviously, some things need the merchant's permission. But the idea is you can manage and monitor these devices as if you're there. We're going to start out with our monitoring view. So this is every transaction as it's happening live. You get to see every transaction, every decline, every error, every check-in. Obviously, some networks will be bigger than others. This is our pilot network. And then we're going to switch to, to the management view. As we switch, it starts to give you the grouping of terminals. Let's zoom in to Vegas. Wi-Fi. <laughs> there it is. If you don't recognize it, that's a SANS. And this is our wall of devices. And so, Charles, let's do something just to make sure they're alive. So not, not exactly find my iPhone, but <laughs> if you lost your terminals in your restaurant. Um, OK, let's, uh, let's do something else. What should we, do? should we do? Change some colors? By the way, this is all sent live. <laughs> so if you want to change the background of your device, if you want to put a new message for your merchants, if they redecorated and want to customize it themselves. OK, what else should we do here? Let's install an app. Let's install an app. So let's say I have a restaurant of, I don't know, five, 10 devices. And I want to push a new app to that merchant because they said they want to try it. Yep. It's installing, installed. So it's, we're going to do this middle row here. You already installed it, right? Yep, it's actually installed already. All of them have flashed. OK, in case you missed that, that middle row changed and we installed a bunch of apps. Now, let's actually say we, we upgraded from a terminal to a POS system. And we want the employees to wake up in the morning and find that new POS system already launched. So now that's the new default app on the terminal. It's the Venn POS system. <laughs> Come on, feel free to clap. OK, what else should we do? Let's let them know that we've installed this app. Great. All right, so I'm going to send them a message. So you can send a message to any terminal in real time. So message showed up here on the terminal. I'm going to swipe that away. Um, we could also play a video. So it's a, it's a dual screen device. A full color dual screen device. You can actually put ads on the second screen. Obviously, we sign and make sure that that ad is legit. But you can actually use that screen in idle mode to present ads to your, to your consumers. Let's send an ad. Oh, I recognize this video. We turned off the sound. Anyone else recognize this video? <laughs> Woo! Woo! OK, let's say I want to dig in and get a full view of what's happening on the terminal. You've got every message, every activity, every feature available at your fingerprints, whether you want to add a merchant or figure out what's going wrong. Let's say you're debugging. Your support staff wants to debug a terminal. A customer calls and says, I'm having trouble with my screen. We can actually grab a screenshot after they give us permission and see what they see on the device. I don't think anyone else's terminal does that, by the way. <laughs> OK, what else, Charles? Um, let's zoom out a little bit. Let's look at the merchant as a whole. So let's look at all the devices at a merchant. In fact, let's view it as the merchant, look at all their activity. 
I don't think we'll have much activity on these devices, but. Nope. One transaction. I, I just did that backstage earlier, <laughs> right, that's transaction. So as you can see, we've created a, power, a powerful terminal management system that gives you access, not just to manage and monitor your terminals, but to actually monetize it and keep your customers happy. Next, I want to show something else. I want to show you our developer SDK. And for the sake of time, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I'm going to ask Charles, uh, I'm going to ask Praveen to come out here. Hey, Praveen. Good job. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. The wall comes, I need you guys going off stage. And, you know, we, we spent a lot of time thinking about how do you make this thing so easy to integrate that anyone can do it? Because what we kept seeing over and over again is after you've paid all the developer SDK fees and after you spent the months in training classes to get a terminal to do what you want, you have to keep doing that over and over again. We wanted something that's simple. So, and interoperability was at the core of that. We work with any accessory, any POS system, old or new. But we said, let's make the integration as simple as possible. So Praveen is going to show us the simplest way to start a transaction on a terminal. This is a simple HTML. I'm pretty sure most of you guys are like me. When it comes to HTML, we are used to copy-pasting, uh, just as how we started copy-pasting PayPal buttons and other stuff. So here I'll show you a simple form page here. Uh, simple form, nothing very complex here. A simple amount field, I hope you can see here. Um, and, and a couple, couple of other fields. One is saying the currency of USD and a security token. So when I add this into a page, and launch that in a browser. This is how it's going to look. A very simple form. All it's showing is an amount and a charge. This is just a simple HTML a simple page. H yeah. So let me change the amount to, let's say, $10. I'm going to hit charge. At this point, it, this is actually talking with our point platform in the background through the point cloud messaging system that, that uh, Charles has demonstrated before. And it invokes a payment on the merchant's terminal right here. So Osama is going to go ahead and complete the payment over there. And as soon as the payment is done, the website received a confirmation that payment has been processed. Uh, this enables a lot of developers, not just the traditional POS system developers, but any web POS developers can automatically launch payments and process payments through our payment terminal, regardless of wherever they run. So this is one of the things we're doing as part of the overall uh, improving the interoperability for our payment terminal with external systems. Over the last one year, uh, we have learned quite a bit that it's, it's very important to help merchants upgrade from their existing systems as opposed to just replacing them. So, I, so we believe interoperability is going to play a very big role, and we're going to continue to spend more time in providing a lot more uh, features to make the interoperability easy and, and, and more secure as possible. And in addition to this, we also enable a couple more features in our SDK. As Osama was saying, uh, since last one year, we, we had a couple of developers who have been beta testing our SDK and gave us a lot of valuable feedback. Um, and based on that, we have added a couple more new features now. Uh, one of them is quite important, which is called a custom tender support, where you can add support for discounts and loyalty programs. And the second one is, uh, again, it goes with what merchants typically look for. There are lots of accessories that merchants use in a typical store, from barcode scanners to weighing scales and other stuff, and, and now we have an API in our SDK that you can use to add plugins to any authority that a merchant would need to, to run their business. So. Thank you, Praveen. Whoa. Okay, and with that, we've been busy for the last year. We're on a mission. That's to enable connected commerce, and we want you guys to join us. We've shown you just a fraction of what, we've, what, we, uh, of what our terminal can do. But we'd love you to come visit our booth, booth 1909, to see a lot more. Thank you. <laughs>